Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon, good evening, good night and good morning, depending on when you're watching the Reds Report. Obviously, it's the land of YouTube, so you could be watching it anywhere. You could be watching it in your underpants. You could be watching it in the garden. Who knows where you are? Carlo, where are you? <laughs> um, yeah, so, yeah, I'm on the fourth floor. Uh, I've kicked my daughter out because it would have been dark yesterday um, when we were with Phil all, so it's a bit more light here, so I'm in the bedroom. Cool. Carlo, you are not the only legend on the podcast or vodcast today. I've never we been a legend. There's only one legend Bobby, at this club. <laughs> Bobby Assel. Good evening, Bobby. You well? Evening, guys. Yeah, absolutely fine. You're looking well. Have you been, uh, have you been very busy today? Uh, yes. Um, I'm just finishing a dissertation. I'm homeschooling with my two youngest kids today also, and obviously still working. <laughs> so it's been oh, a busy day. Me. You're spinning a lot of plates. We, we thank you very much for making time for us. I know we've only got half an hour because you are rushing up to do other bits and bobs that you've got to do. So we'll, we'll no crack problem. on without any further ado. Uh, Bobby, thanks for coming on. Let's yeah, talk about your time at Barnsley. We'll, we'll, we'll go all the way back to the beginning. Carlos, shall I pull up the slide? Shall we yeah, you might as well, aren't you? You might as well. Yeah. Just have a look at this then, Bobby, and, and, and just talk yeah. us through... Let's have a look at that. What do you think to that? So we've got your appearances there. Carlo, for the, for the podcast, would you like to read them out? Uh, yeah, so um, it, it says Bobby Hassel. It should be Sir Bobby Hassel. Appearances 299, goals 8, debut 3rd of August 2004 versus MK Dons, a match that was uh, drawn 1-1. Uh, first mm -hmm. goal came on the 10th of December 2005 versus Scunthorpe, a match that was 1-5-2. And his final appearance on the 3rd of May 2014 versus QPR, a match that we lost 3-2. But we're going to take vengeance for that a week on Saturday. Yes, <laughs> correct. Bobby, just, just your first goal and just talk us through that first goal, 10th of December 2005 in Scunthorpe. 5-2, were any defenders actually playing that day? I'm just trying to remember it now as it's come up. I'm sure it was a header. I'm sure Jacob Burns uh, put the cross in from a, a free kick uh, and I got him, got away from my marker. A uh, nice little header in, just in front of the keeper. I'm sure that's the goal, so I hope it is. <laughs> not, not, not your favourite Barnsley goal, though, no? No, no. My, uh, my favourite goal was against Newcastle. Uh, it was what late on. What do you say uh, I think it was last five minutes and we ended up drawing that game 2-2. I think it was 2010, that game. There we go. Yeah, there it is. Is that, is the, that the one? one? Yeah, that's the one. That's my favourite goal. You look like you're enjoying it. That's a little bit of a celebration from you, which you, you're not overly uh, hyped on celebrations, are you? you? You like to keep a level head, but yeah. it looks like you're enjoying that one. Well, if I remember that game, which uh, they were, I think, top of the league. I think it was around 20,000 there. We were, we were on a Christmas do straight after this. <laughs> uh, it was just a good feeling during the game. Um, I had a really good game as well that game. So... To, to, to score that goal, I think it was the last five minutes. It was a special occasion. Yeah, and got, you got a well-earned point. Um, Bobby, we, we saw your stats there for Barnsley. It's mm. extremely rare. Um, we, we've talked to quite a few ex-players over, um, over these last few weeks. Um, we've got one of your colleagues coming on later on tonight when we, when we talk to Paul Reid. Um, mm. When we look at you, two, two clubs, okay, in, and a time in India as well. Yeah. Was that because you were always settled at, at, at Mansfield and obviously very settled at Barnsley? You were never, you know, chasing the big dream or more money? You seem like a very 
Um, it's, well, it's not often that people in the professional career play for two clubs. Is it, is it about you were happy where you were and that's all that mattered? Or Yeah, no. Uh, three things, really. I'm generally a very loyal guy. Uh, so it takes a lot to get me away from um, from a club or in any relationship and with uh, friends, etc. So I'm very loyal to them that, uh, you know, I work for, etc. And I'm close friends with. So that's one thing. The other, the other point with when I was at Mansfield and Barnsley, injuries came at a wrong time where I was just about to get a move to Newcastle and Tottenham when I was at Mansfield and had two long-term injuries uh, that curtailed their moves. And the same at Barnsley was just very close to a move at one point and, and then had a, a, an injury that curtailed that. And then after that, I had a chance to move probably four times um, and there were genuine moves. Uh, two times the club refused to let me go. And then uh, right at the end, when I was 30, I had a chance to go to Leeds um, at that time. And by that time, I'd become a Christian. So I prayed about this and I did want to, if I'll be honest, I did want to leave. I'd been there a long time. Uh, you know, manager had come in, I didn't really get on with. I thought it was the right time to go. Uh, and then Barnsley, the next day after I prayed about it, offered me a new four-year deal virtually. So, wow. Wow. Uh, so yeah, it was a sign for me to stay, which I, I honoured Patrick with that. He did his best to keep me, yeah. um, and I stayed. Um, and then if I, if I'm, I've said this before, if I be honest, if the money was around today as it was uh, as it is today back then, I'd have probably left. Of course, of course. Uh, clubs are only offering probably five hundred pound more to a thousand. I know it's a lot of money, but in general terms in football, when you're settled and you, you're living and you're, you're club captain, it's not that much. If you go somewhere, it's an extra 10 grand a week, which is happening now. If you leave Barnes to another championship club, you're getting another 10 grand a week. I would have left. and I would have been silly not to. Yeah. But I, know, I don't regret anything. I don't regret being at the club 10 years. It was a fantastic time. I had some unbelievable memories. And it afforded me the chance to build up some great relationships. And in, in essence, when I left and retired uh, and come back from India, I generally came back to the club within two or three months because of that relationship I had with Patrick. Yeah, of course. And we'll move on to that way when we get to to the back end of your career. We'll just just take a big step all the way to the beginning. Yeah. How did how did football begin for you, Bobby? Were you always a footballer? Was it another sport? Was was it always going to be Mansfield? How did all that begin? Yeah. Uh, well, I was generally good at most sports when I was a kid. Uh, I had a football. I was playing football from three and. Four. Or yeah, football by the age of 15. Uh, I obviously chose football. That was my first passion. Um, and I'd, I'd come through the ranks at Derby and Stoke uh, from 10 to 15. And I generally, I kind of, what happened was I broke my foot when I was 15. And I'd just right. broken into the England schoolboys team by then and, and then didn't make the final selection because of my injury. I was out nearly eight months. And by the time I got back, Took me a long time to get going again. So, in essence, I got released from uh, my hometown club, uh, Derby County, and then ended up at Mansfield three months later. Uh, again, it's not a regret because I made my debut within three or four months of being at Mansfield. I probably wouldn't have happened if I'd have stayed at Derby. Much bigger club. They were in the top league at the time. Mansfield at the bottom league. Uh, and I don't regret that because I think nine of the youth team that we all played, uh, we all got in the first team and we all played probably 150 games together and we got promoted together. Um, that that youth team we had there was special. I don't think it'll ever be matched at a club at lower levels. I think I think in total we made 6,000 appearances at Championship and Premier League, the team that was there. Uh, so it was a special youth team that we had, uh, a three-year three period. And we all got in the first team, got promoted and then moved on at the same time as well. Wow, wow. Well. What footballer was on your bedroom wall like that's who, who you aspired to be like? Uh, well, I never, I was never one for putting posters up, but I was always uh, John Barnes and Paul Gascoigne were my heroes growing up. I was a Liverpool fan growing up, uh, but Paul Gascoigne played in my position. He was very similar to me in terms of playing style, and though he won't believe that being a defender. Yeah. But when I was uh, from five to 16, I, I was an attacking midfield player. Right, they scored yeah. lots of goals, uh, and when I nearly broke, when I broke into the England schoolboys uh, team, which I would have got into that team if I wouldn't have broken my foot, I played up front for them two week trials with Michael Owen. I actually scored more goals in him as well. 
Um, so yeah, I broke my leg. He broke his leg, but he he obviously was a big name. I didn't know that at that time. He was hyped up at Liverpool, and obviously he came back from his injury, went straight into that squad, and I was out a year, so I missed out. But that mid that midfield role obviously suited you because you ended up playing later on. Uh, when we had injuries in midfield, especially on that cut run, which we'll, which will also come yeah. to at yeah. some point. Um, out of your 299 appearances, then which which stands up there as, as your favourite? Then Bobby, what we you think that was? I probably played my best football, mm. or or was it your best for the, the just the emotion, the adrenaline, and the, the success? Uh, Would you be up there? Yeah, the, the, it's a difficult one, Tance. I think three stand out. Well, four is my debut. Yeah, can have four. Yeah, uh, <laughs> and then obviously the playoff final when we won at, um, at Cardiff. Uh, FA Cup semi-final, even though it was for different reasons. Um, it was just the occasion. Obviously, the result was, wasn't was great. And then uh, I'd say the Newcastle game. Dom kind of, I spoke with Luke Steele the other day. Bless him, he sent me a birthday message and talked about the Chelsea game. I'll never forget that. Uh, I played decent in that game, yeah, but I always remember the Newcastle game. I was marking Gutierrez. Um, it's probably, I feel it was my best performance in a shirt for Barnsley. Um, That's interesting. That's interesting. Yeah. We, what about... Yeah, we, you, you, oh, Gower, sorry. sorry you, you spoke about some of the players that you've you've played against, played with. What about a, a Barnsley? During those 299 um, yeah. appearances, a co- for you, who was the most gifted player that, that, that you've played with at Barnsley? Uh, Stephen Matt Fail, I say this every time. Um, I went on to play with the likes of Kieran Trippier, obviously, and John Stones. I've gone on and been England players, and that one playing for Man City and, and obviously Atletico Madrid. So, fantastic players. But Stephen Matt Fail was a better player than both of them. Hmm. Um, we, and, and it's interesting because we spoke to uh, Hugo Colacci, um, yes, it was yesterday, wasn't it? And we asked yeah. him, there was a, big, a bit of a, a language barrier, but we sort of asked him, from yeah, your yeah. time at Barnsley, if you could pick one of the players in his peak then to your banger side, who would you want? And he wanted El Capitan, as he said, and he wanted you to go yeah. to banger. So please yeah. don't go, you know, don't, don't, <laughs> don't, don't take the boots back. But a lot of the players, uh, Daniel Bogdanovic, uh, Anthony Kay, that we've been speaking to over the last few weeks, They've all, when we asked about a five-a-side team that they wanted, um, your name keeps being mentioned in there. And it seemed like a very special group of, 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 of players yeah. at the time. It's, um, I mean, it's, it's very humbling, I've got to say. I, I've, I've seen a lot. Do you know how many, Bobby, you played with at Barnsley? Do you know how many players you played with? I've got it. No, Barnsley FC stats man has pulled it up for me, Andy. Uh, you have played with 154 different teammates at Barnsley, <laughs> which is unbelievable, isn't it? Yeah, it is, yeah. And in that time, you sit 23rd on the all-time appearance list as well for Barnsley. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, that's, that's some achievement. You must be proud of yourself. And I know you're a very humble man. and it, You know, you, you yeah, won't it gets to you. But it's, you know, it's yeah, never... it's, it's strange because when you've stopped playing and you look back, you feel like you've never played. It really is a weird one, and you play with so many players, and you forget what an impact you've had on people as well, which is, which is always nice. But yeah, it, it's nice. A lot of ex players I've seen their teams that I've always been in them. I've always, they've always said I'm the most underrated player they've played with. They've always been the ones that have said they want, wanted me next to them if they if they went out and played in a game. So I must have had an impact on people. Um, oh. Hugo Colacci goes even further and he wants to organise, when football is back, some sort of pre-season friendly from his, his, his <laughs> banger side, either against an academy side or the Barnsley first team. And I think he said There's he wants to play one There's half of the Barnsley game. kids. Ulterior motive then for naming me and his team. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you mentioned uh, playing in midfield, Bobby, um, earlier on in your career. And, and we covered, we've already spoke about the Liverpool game uh, and that FA Cup run. You played, I'm right, I'm thinking you played in central midfield for, for those games. Yeah. Definitely the Chelsea one, I remember that. Yeah, uh, I was right back for the Liverpool game and then centre, centre mid for the Chelsea game, yeah. Was that a tactical uh, issue or was that an in, was that injury? No, was the, Anderson De Silva uh, had got a serious cruciate ligament injury um, and that's why I ended up playing centre mid, just because Anderson was out. Um, you know, it worked, I suppose, for the Chelsea game. Uh, for us because we had to be more defensive and that was my game gosh, um, gosh. but I think if if either stays fit that's it before we went on that run we were doing quite well uh, before Christmas 
in the league. Anderson De Silva got injured and I think uh, Heinz Muller got injured as well. Uh, particularly Anderson though. If he'd have stayed fit, I think we'd have finished mid-table uh, that year yeah. and we ended up having to scrap to stay up in the end. Um, yeah, sure. yeah, I only played there due, due to injury. Did you enjoy that role? I mean, what are you thinking? You're thinking you're going out, or oh, well, against Chelsea, against the time they ended up being, they ended up in semi-final at Champions League that season. So you're playing against the high standard of player, and you're playing out of position or not not your natural position at that time. Yeah. What's going through your mind when you've been asked to do it? I mean, obviously the gaffer must have trusted you. Yeah, yeah, I was comfortable playing any position apart from poss- possibly left wing. I played everywhere growing up. And literally everywhere from, obviously, across the back four, right wing, centre mid and up front. Uh, so I was quite comfortable anywhere. And that's th- something we try and bring into our academy in terms of playing players, certainly at a young age, all over the, all over the pitch. So they just get accustomed to different positions. Okay. So I was OK playing there. I always knew it was my best position, centrally. I think if it had been probably 6-2, six, 6-3, six, I'd have always been a centre-half. I feel I've had a much better career at centre half. I probably would have played in the Premier League. I would have backed myself to play in the Premier League at centre half. Um, but obviously, I was only five foot ten, so I ended up at right back. And so I was comfortable playing in the central positions at centre mid. I read the game quite well. I was I was very statistically even to the end of my career when statistics started coming in. My pass uh, completion was better than everyone. So I kept I kept the ball well. Uh, so I was quite comfortable in there. And this, this, I mean, uh, Chris mentioned the, the amount of players that you've played with. There is a handful of players, I suppose, that um, have played for us and have continued in, in their careers to, to do things for the club. Martin Devaney, obviously, as, as under 23s, um, doing his coaching. Um, Jim O'Brien, we had on the other week, he's doing some, putting some hours in when it all goes back towards his UEFA. And Bruce mm-hmm. Dyer, obviously, not with, uh, with the academy, but definitely sort of staying around. Yeah. Um, is that something? Because you said you went, you went to India. You played for uh, was it Barat? Or, it was near Pune, Barat, wasn't yeah, it? Barat, I, mean, yeah. Yeah, I worked there for a while, um, and, and you came back. Was it always your intention to come back to Barnsley? And I know obviously you settled there, and, and you, you were kids in the area and going to school. Was it always your intention to try and get back to Barnsley if the opportunity was there, or were you open to sort of you know any job in football? Uh, well, no. The truth is, I was going into ministry when I when I quit. I was going into full time ministry. Um, yeah. a series of events happened uh, when we went me and Bruce went to a, a, an outreach centre for drugs and alcoholics and as, a, as we were there I felt clearly that basically what happened after that night is I prayed and fasted for three days uh, and then Patrick rang me on the Monday and offered me to come straight back into the club okay. so again I know faith not for everyone but for me it was a big thing and I really wanted to get into full-time ministry and come out of the industry of football. Um, but I felt clearly that night, it, like you've forgotten your own. So basically what I did, as I said, I prayed and I fasted for three days and then I got a phone call on a Monday of Patrick to come around to his house, which I did. And then we arranged from that to come back in. Uh, and by that time, I decided to obviously retire and came back. I wasn't sure what role I'd be coming back at the time because uh, all the jobs were filled at the football club he just wanted me back in the building mm. um, Lee Johnson was under a lot of pressure at the time uh, we had a big chat about that I spoke to Patrick about giving him more time I knew Lee was a great guy he just lost I think 8 out eight out of 8 and then he went and lost 9 out of 9 um, so obviously when I first came back into the building with Lee there was a bit of I'd walked in the building next player everyone's expecting me to come back as manager uh, that was never the case uh, and me and Lee got on really well, uh, and he trusted me straight away, which was great. Uh, and he went around and turned it around, one nine on the bounce, and then got his move. So it worked out in the end. When I came back, obviously, I came back just as head of recruitment for the academy and got involved with some first team stuff. Um, so, yeah, it worked out that way. And that's how I ended up back at the football club. And, and I suppose maybe not literally, but I think some of the work when you talk about the, the, the ministry work you wanted to do, you're very much involved in the life, life of youngsters and football can be a dangerous game. There are lots of temptations. Sometimes there's lots of money being thrown about. So I suppose part of your role is shaping these young players into decent human beings as well, isn't it? I suppose. Yeah, yeah. We have a holistic approach towards the lads. It's not just about football because the reality is 99% don't make it. 
So we try and educate them, and to, certainly the education is a big driver for us that we always reiterate to the players. But I always reiterate messages in terms of thinking outside of football and then creating, as you say, they're a decent human being. If they can come out of our academy, if they've been in a long time, a much better person than when they came in, I think that's job done. They can offer something back to society and not just the football industry. Uh, and they usually pick up really good skill sets in football, whether it's discipline, resilience, etc. And they can take that into other industries. Um, it, you know, though they want to be footballers, they pick up, as I said, they acquire skills that they can transfer into any industry. Although you are no doubt one of the busiest men in Barnsley with the job that you do, uh, Bobby, yeah. uh, and obviously you're off again after this. Um, do you enjoy it? And what is it you enjoy about it? Yeah, I absolutely love it. I, I, when, when Patrick asked me to take over as academy manager, um, I, I wasn't really sure about it, in all honesty. I loved what I was doing in terms of recruitment. I was at games a lot of the time. I really enjoyed that. Uh, I managed to pick up some really good players that are in the club now um, and ones that have moved on. And I enjoyed it. I knew coming to an academy manager's role, it incorporates a whole, hell, hell of a lot of management and lots of different departments and, and things that really ex-players probably don't like in terms of facilitating meetings, doing a lot of administration work, attending loads of meetings. And I had to go on lots of courses, um, as, which are mandatory courses as well. So when I first come, I didn't think I'd enjoy it. But yeah, I've loved it, in all honesty. It's been great being able to develop young lads. But also, I, my job is to develop coaches and, and staff as well uh, and mentor them and, and help them on their careers, which is what we do within the academy. You've seen Dale Tong's moved up. Um, a lot of the first team staff have made, made up from our academy, sports science, analytical work. And then we've uh, Adam, Adam Murray came last year and now he's obviously assistant manager um, and one of the assistants. So, yeah, the academy do a good job in supplying the first team, not only with players, but staff also. And that's because Patrick's that. legacy, isn't it? I remember Patrick saying a few years ago, in fact, on the Reds report, it's not just about bringing players in from the academy. It's all about bringing coaches in like he did with Paul Hackingbottom when Lee Johnson yeah. went, being able to uh, coach that type of football and, and obviously, you know, um, Paul did very, very well for us. You talk about um, Adam coming in. Um, and it's good, isn't it? Because I think uh, when new ownership came in, there was a lot of worries with fans that, you know, they'd alienate. But that DNA, that's still going. That, that, that heartbeat that Patrick provided is still breathing through in your role, the youngsters, the coaches and everything else, doesn't it? Yeah, absolutely. It's not myself and Martin who we brought back to the club and those underneath him uh, continue to do that. But I think it makes it makes sense. It makes economical sense. It certainly makes, uh, you know, football sense in terms of the likes of myself and Martin and others. We know the club inside out. You're able to develop in an academy environment for three or four years and really learn, learn your trade without any real pressures apart from trying to produce players. Yeah. You don't get judged on winning and losing. You're able to make mistakes. You're able to experiment with tactics, etc. So it's a great learning curve for coaches coming through the system. It's great for me in terms of management um, yeah. and what I want to do long term. Um, so yeah, the academy environment's really professionalised now. It's regulated by the Premier League. It's not like it was five to ten years ago. So it's highly professional now, up and down the land. That's not just our academy. That's every academy. You've mentioned numerous players that have, have made that step into coaching uh, amongst Barnsley and into management. Um, I work in education. A lot of the best teachers always end up being in management. Yeah. Uh, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to be good at that role. Yeah, uh, yeah. Some, some, some skills trans, transfer over. I'm guessing mm. my question to you, Bobby, is what, what kind of skills do you think have put yourself and Martin in good stead, I guess, from, yeah. from the footballing days? And what, what's gone with you onto mm. that management role? Well, I think when well, I was a captain of the dressing room for most of all, so you've got natural leadership skills and management skills. It's just learning different skill sets along with that. That, in terms of discipline, uh, resilience, all these things that you need uh, as a player, you also need as a manager. You also need as a coach. Obviously, the football side of it, the tactical side, the coaches, it becomes second nature to them. You have 20 years of being coached playing in games and then you're just transferring it the biggest issue and the hardest task to start with is actually transferring out of your mouth 
what yes. you know in there, that becomes a, that's a skill in itself for coaches. And I've seen vast improvements in the likes of Martin. Um, Pecky came in and coached when I was coming to the end of my playing days. And when he first started, in terms of communication, was awful. And Martin was was not great when he first came in, but now they're at, they're outstanding coaches. They communicate their knowledge really well now. I think that's a lot of the problem when you first come out of football. It's actually communicating it and being able to teach. That's and interesting. It's a totally yeah. different skill set. Yeah, yeah. Before Chris asks the final question, because I know it's, time's knocking on, a really quick one. Um, you've played yeah. for a lot of coaches. Some you got on with, some you didn't. That's life, isn't it? it happens. The best yeah. piece of advice you've ever been given as a player. That's good. Uh, um, that's a good one, Matt. I think the best, the best no, piece of advice I had, well, I'll go to my, my captain at Mansfield, who was just coming to the end of his career, said, enjoy every minute because within a blink of an eye, you'll be stood where I am. And it was re really true. 18 years, 19 years, just flew. Yeah. Um, yeah. flew. But from a coach, the best piece of advice uh, was probably Steve Parkin that gave me. And it was a simple piece of advice. As long as you give 100% in every training session and gain, he says you'll not go wrong. Yeah, yeah, and that's, 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 that's the same advice. Mecky. That's the same advice Alex Mullet got off uh, off his manager when he left yeah. Leeds. Yeah. You were saying that that was the exact same. Yeah, and that's it. Like, if you're good enough, as I say, if you give if you give that uh, dedication 100, percent if you're good enough, you you're going to have a good career. I make it. Bobby, quick fire just before you go. I know you're a very busy man, so we better get you on your way. No I'm problem. gonna run a few names past you. Yeah, you can put a quick 10, seg ten second uh, sentence together describing them or what you think of that. Or person. you can pass. Or you can pass. I've not got the list. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll, we'll look at players then. Uh, Adam well, Hamill. Incredible player. Funny guy. Uh, yeah, love the guy. Love him. Uh, Darren Moore. Oh, what a, what a guy. He, he helped bring, brought, uh, bring me to faith, so we're really close still. Fantastic uh, player and hopefully be a fantastic manager. When you said Darren brought, helped bring you to faith, did you, did you get in touch with him and then you... Well, no, when he came to Barnsley, he was a Christian himself. Right, OK. Um, yeah, so he was kind of... I, I came close to him and then realised all, all about what the gospel message was through Darren. Brilliant. That's yeah. a story in itself. Uh, Emmanuel Thringpong. <laughs> I've got to pass on that one. So. <laughs> Mido. Oh, again, great guy. No, Good great, guy. great. Great, great. Uh, yeah. Jim O'Brien. Yeah, good guy. I, I, my kind of person in the dressing room. We had lots of fights, but he cared, and I love people with that passion, that care. Great guy. And that's probably why yourself and, and Jim had such a good time at Barnsley. You cared, didn't you? You yeah. cared. Yeah, it was uh, passion. I'll run through your managers really quickly. I know you're in a rush. Uh, Hart. Brilliant. Absolutely. The, I owe him everything. He brought me to the club. Um, was the best coach I've ever worked with. Wow. That's interesting. Uh, Richie. Oh, just fantastic manager. Not, again, in terms of coaching, nowhere near Paul Art, but fantastic manager. Got the best out of everyone. Yeah. The best manager I've played for. Came over as a very good people person, didn't he? Yeah, he was, and that's half of the skill. If you can get the best out of someone, you don't really have to coach a great deal. Of course, of course. Mm -hmm. uh, Simon Davey? Yeah, I know he got a lot of stick, but I loved playing for him. I thought he was a fantastic guy, good coach, and I got on, re uh, got on with him really well. Uh, Mark Robbins? Uh, measurable, measurable, but again, got on with him really well. Trusted me, he rang me on uh, regular occasions for advice on terms of doing things around the club and, and tactically. So, again, another good relationship. That's interesting, but just uh, didn't pile enough. <laughs> <laughs> Keith Hill, uh, you know what? I know everyone said before that, but Keith was honest with me, and uh, that's all you can ever ask for. He was very honest with me. Uh, yeah, we didn't get on, but. I, I respected him for his honesty. Yeah, of course. And obviously, Flickcroft. And totally dishonest. So that's why we didn't get on. Totally dishonest with me. It might have been fair. great with everyone else, but dishonest with me. Okay, fair enough. A lot of them words that you've used, other than the last one, for the players and the managers alone, some brilliant superlatives there, which you hope to see throughout the coaches that you're, you're kind yeah, of managing. Yeah. 
I mean, it's funny because we flicker. We get on now and I speak and we get on. But when I, when I played, he was just dishonest with me. And I've, I, you know, I've confronted him about it since. And we, we've got on, we've both made, made our peace. We speak to each other as regular, quite regular, actually, on various things. So I've no issues with David. Listen, Bobby, you've played just short of 300 games. It was never always going to be plain sailing, was it? No, no, no. <laughs> Carlo, would you like to say anything to Bobby just before uh, we end the episode? Uh, listen, you know, he, 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 he goes around the Sir Bobby Hassel to all the fans. Uh, anybody that puts in <laughs> 10 years for a club, uh, you know, 299 appearances is a legend. I love the fact of, um, you know, your faith is very important to you. You don't give in on that either. You know, for some people, it might not be seen as not popular or not this. Um, I always find it refreshing to talk to Bob um, as a person, watching him as a footballer, and I just think the academy is probably in the best hands it ever will be in, as long as we've got Bobby at the helm of it. That's all I've got to say. There you go. Some very nice words. Bobby, uh, from myself, thank you for coming on. Uh, Cheers, love, love watching playing. Uh, love watching you play as a kid. An absolute hero of mine. Mm. Um, I don't, I don't think you're getting cross keys team, if I'm honest, but I do. Um, you're welcome to come and have a trial if, if ever you fancy. I'll stop Bobby. recording now, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> I no, Bobby. After 10 minutes. <laughs> no, thank you very much for coming on. We really do appreciate you. Thanks for having me on, guys. Club. Good luck with everything you're working on in the academy. You've got a bit of a, yeah. an extended summer to work on things now. Yeah, so yeah. all the best. Uh, enjoy your summer with your family and things. Cheers, and we'll Bob. See you soon. All right. Cheers, guys. God bless you. Thank you. Bye. Thanks. Thanks. Bye.